So, the Swiss democracy is one of its kind. No other country lets its citizens have that much of an impact on their rules and regulations. Meanwhile, in a time where everything gets digitized, it's only a natural conclusion that this might also affect voting someday. So, earlier this year, the Swiss Post released their e-voting source code as part of a mandatory public intrusion test, or PIT for short. Yeah, and that's where our story starts. My name is Janis Kirschner. I'm a Swiss cybersecurity researcher and CTF player. Um, together with my research team, ZUAD0, we analyzed the Swiss e-voting source code. Obviously, my views are my own, and not my employers, grandmas, or dogs. So, a little bit of background information. Why should we vote digitally in the first place? So, one of the main arguments was that it's comfortable for expats, for people living abroad, because for them, voting used to be quite a hassle. They have to send the votes per mail, and sometimes the mail gets lost and, or arrive too late. So that's one of the main reasons. Also, it should attract young voters, and it should make voting more accessible to the public. However, with the e-voting also comes with some major downsides. Uh, security risks are on scale. You don't have to bribe a few thousand people. You have to find the right exploit, and maybe you can even do it in the comfort of your home and home. Also, it's very expensive to maintain, and it, the systems must be trusted. And it's hard to create that trust, because how do you make sure that the software running on these voting machines is actually the software that has been released or tested? The first thing that comes to mind is a checksum. I mean, checksums are great, right? But how do you make sure the checksum program is right and not just a static string? So <laughs> that's one of the major problems. I often hear a comparison between electronic voting and electronic banking. However, I think there are major differences. And in my opinion, it's easier to protect electronic banking because there you have transactions between two parties that can easily be identified and corrected. In electronic voting, you have to guarantee absolute anonymity for the voter, which makes it pretty hard. There are two components. There is the universal verifiability and the individual verifiability that uh, are supposed to make you validate uh, your votes mathematically. These are some core components of electronic voting. So, yeah, the process is, um, if, you, if you vote offline, you uh, usually have your vote and you put it in a ballot box uh, and then you have a lot of people that, that count the votes. You have election helpers, you have uh, election observers, etc. But if you vote online, you just send your request to the server and afterwards you get a checksum back. And that checksum is for your individual verifiability that you can prove mathematically that your uh, vote has been counted correctly. On the other side, for the government, they get the universal verifiability where they can check if all votes have been counted correctly, mathematically. So, fast forward a bit. Electronic voting is nothing new, per se. Many cantons already had electronic voting solutions in place. Um, for example, Basel or Geneva. However, the new part is that the government wanted to use electronic voting as an official cha channel, as an official voting channel all, all over Switzerland. So there were some problems. Geneva had to stop their e-voting pro uh, program completely, and Basel is on the verge of it because electronic voting is extremely expensive. There were some studies that said for every effective user, a user that used electronic voting, over 10 years, the canton of Basel would have to pay around 4,000 Swiss francs, which is honestly quite a lot. Yeah. And uh, Geneva is an interesting example because it developed its own electronic voting solution that has been used by some of the cantons in Switzerland. So, 
source code publication. It was pretty interesting when we could get our hands on this very special code, this very important code. And so it started with the great news. We went to the website. We wanted to download it. And we were greeted with a non-disclosement agreement. This struck me as odd, because I thought the code was supposed to be open source. However, the Swiss Post introduced open code, uh, which is basically re release a snapshot of the code under an NDA. So the code is public, but uh, it's, it's not really open source. Not at all. So yeah. Nevertheless, we signed up for it, because yeah, we wanted to test the code. And the first thing we noticed is how big the code actually was. Like, uh, it was around a quarter million lines of code. It, it, was, it was really big. Uh, and uh, it featured a microservice architecture of several components that talked with each other. It was really, really a big solution. And another thing that was really, really big was the dependencies. They had a lot of dependencies, like really a lot. And um, history has shown that dependencies can be really dangerous. Um, one example that I like to come up with is uh, EventStream, early 2018, where a developer got tired of uh, maintaining his nice little project and transferred ownership to someone who offered help. However, that person was a malicious actor, and yeah, now a few thousand uh, programs featured malware in it. And also in the e-voting code, we found some dependencies that third-party libraries that were vulnerable to several exploits. However, the functions weren't exactly used, so the risk wasn't that big. But alone that the fact that these, these libraries were present shows that, yeah, it's a real threat and that patch management is hard. So where do you start when you got such a big software? Um, a first point would be documentation. You look at uh, how does it work, what's the threat model, just look how it works. So in the Geneva system, uh, they had a lot of documentation. They had like threat models for every component. Um, but in the new Swiss Post system, there were only three high-level documents, some about the cryptography, a little bit high-level voting workflow, a little bit lower level, but it wasn't that useful. It also featured uh, some API descriptions, but most of them were internal and weren't of much use. But there, there was something interesting. There were security audits performed before the public intrusion test. And these are great because you can see maybe there were invalid patches or just see what are the core parts that are interesting to look at. So we went to the Swiss Post website. We downloaded it, and the file sizes seemed oddly small. Now, when you open these PDFs, they only seem to contain the covers and the table of contents. Honest mistake, of course. Everybody published the wrong thing. But after some further investigation, it showed that this was on purpose to protect the IP law of the <laughs> uh, company that audited it. And they didn't want to give out those reports, which was kind of a bummer. So OK, we had to work without any documentation. So next thing you usually do is, yeah, set up the system and check a bit how does it work, how does it interact, how play with it. However, you couldn't build the system. Uh, the system wasn't buildable at all. The system wasn't meant to be built. The system relied on an internal build server at the development company in Spain. Uh, and you were only supposed to access the system during the official public intrusion test where they provided you with a test instance. So even with some public effort to reconstruct the source code uh, by several parties, um, it didn't work out. It was just a too limited time frame. And yeah, the system was too big. So all that was left was static analysis over the whole thing. So. During our research, uh, the media blew up a bit about the news of some e-voting leak. This is odd, I thought, because uh, the system was released, right? Were there some components they were hiding or something? 
Uh, no, it turns out some people took the source code and uploaded it to their own GitHub repositories, so others could evade the non-disclosement agreements. And obviously, this was uh, there were DMCA claims filed against it, and so this news could have been avoided if they would have open sourced the solution. Yeah, so. This function is really interesting. How does it make you feel? How does it make you feel with user input? How does it make you feel with user input that's not validated? Yeah, you know what I want to imply here. Um, the component called Secure Data Manager didn't seem as secure at all. Uh, however, the post assured us that it's actually very secure because the cantons that uh, run this component would use some air gaps, and air gaps have proven to be very effective over time, right? So, yeah, um, very secure and out of scope, but they were happy to tell us that they would silent patch it. So it's all great. So this was around the time when the actual public intrusion test started and you were provided with two URLs that you could test. It was the voting workflow and the administration workflow. Well, you could only test the voting workflow. The administration workflow uh, required some certificate-based authentication. And however, they didn't provide these certificates. They didn't pro provide them on purpose because it wouldn't be realistic to provide them, right? So you, could, you couldn't test the admin interface at all, you, maybe through post-exploitation. So all that was left was the voting workflow, which brings us to the pit scope. To illustrate it, we started out with around a quarter million lines of code, right? We put it through a public intrusion test, and we get this. This isn't cut off. These are nine rest endpoints. That was the pit scope. Yeah, nine, nine rest endpoints, which were very interesting. We looked at them. Surely they must be very secure. I mean, security must be tight there. So, but uh, even with that scope, we still found some stuff. Um, it turns out they use the X forwarded four headers, which transmit your IP address, and you can change them client side. And they relied on these headers for their internal Splunk logs. So you could just spoof some arbitrary IP addresses into their logs, into their internal logs. This one was also accepted as one of the few vulnerabilities of the system, which is really interesting, even with narrow scope. Yeah, and. Do you, do you remember the universal verifiability from the beginning? Yeah, apparently it's been broken as well. Some researchers found that <laughs> apparently if you had access to the system and if you could change the votes, then theoretically under some circumstances you could also do it undetectable. And so much for the e-voting solution. Apparently they weren't allowed to continue with it anymore. Um, what holds the future? Um, currently, there were discussions about an e-voting moratorium in Switzerland where they wanted to halt all e-voting projects for five years. Um, I've also seen developments made by big corporations. Microsoft recently released an e-voting library written in plain C. Must be interesting to look at. Uh, and yeah, it still features a lot of interesting research area. So in conclusion, e-voting is interesting, but with great power comes great responsibility. And if you want to uh, develop an e-voting e system, please put sufficient care into it. Thank you. Is there any questions? If yes, go to the microphones to the left or the right. Dun -dun. Yeah, to the left. Do we, did you have a chance to 
take a look at the source code from the Geneva solution as well, or only the post. Swiss post system, mm -hmm. I didn't audit the Geneva system, however, uh, I looked at it from just from the perspective. Geneva did a lot of things right there. They open sourced it properly, they provided lots of documentation and it just seemed a little bit more fitting, so I just looked at it from a program perspective and it, they made it easier for researchers. They had also a buildable system, they provided Docker containers, so that's for the Geneva system but I can't make any assumptions from a code perspective. On the right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, so thanks for the talk. Uh, do you know why you couldn't build the, the source code? Was it a part of source code missing uh, or something like that? So basically the source code relied on an internal build server uh, uh, at Skytel. So if you wanted to build it, you would need to have all the correct components, right? and you will basically need to reconstruct the, the build process for you. So since they didn't provide that, it would have been very, very complicated. And some people tried exactly that, to figure out which components were used and write your own build scripts. But uh, the problem was that there wasn't enough time to do that. Okay. To the left. Um, yes. Hello. Uh, if uh, um, if there were no vulnerability with this universal verifiability, uh, wouldn't uh, would then Switzerland had uh, online voting? And can you tell me about a bit about more about this uh, universal verifiability vulnerability? What uh, access to the systems should have the operator uh, operator have to to use it? So basically, you're saying that. Um, what are the effects of the universal verifiability vulnerabilities? If, if, if this problem wouldn't have appeared, then Switzerland would have had online voting for, for the elections in October, right? Uh, quite possibly. Okay. Quite possibly. I mean, there were other, uh, other problems, like especially the one with uh, the source code that wasn't open source and some parts were missing and you couldn't build it. Usually, um, the, the text from the government said that you should be able to build it, and maybe th this would have uh, caused problems, but it was certainly an important factor that it can be built. Uh, yeah, that it can be employed. Yeah, yeah then a big thanks and a big applause. Thank you.